Chapter 5. Unique Traits of Our Pedagogy 1. The Pedagogy of the Heart We might begin by asking ourselves, what does the phrase pedagogy of the heart, phrase that has appeared in our educational texts since the beginning, mean for us within our educational tradition? By analyzing the texts that refer to our educational mission, we are able to deduce that it is one of the fundamental pillars upon which our pedagogy has rested. The pedagogy of the heart has its point of departure in the reparative charism, which is the core of the educational system unique to the Institute. We have seen, in the last chapter, how the primary objective of our message of evangelization is the proclamation of Jesus Christ. This witness becomes effective when, once it is presented, it penetrates the heart of our students, and we use it as our platform for education, with all that this implies. From the beginnings, the handmaids who were teachers had a subtle and precious intuition about what educating the heart and educating from the heart meant. The expression appears for the first time in 1885, in a writing of Mother Maria de los Santos Martes. If they truly want to gain the hearts of the girls, it must only be with the intention of gaining them for the heart of Jesus. Cutting stones is relatively easy if one has good tools at hand. A stone can be chiseled, people are not like stones, education has never been easy, nor have there ever been magic formulas to accomplish it. A good educator is not content with simply transmitting good information, keeping up to date with new developments. There is, rather, an education that is permeated with feeling, with empathy, the pedagogy of the heart, the pedagogy of selfless giving, of tenderness, patience, of careful attention to the poor, the weak, and the smallest. The first handmaids learned it from our foundresses, Mother Fernanda del Corazon de Jesus, Prefect of the Academy of Cadiz, writes the following to Mother Pillar. The Academy continues to get organized, I believe that we managed to follow the plans and desires that you communicated to us. Firstly, in the retreat you gave us in the Academy community, when you visited, as far as the formation of the hearts of the girls. This specific concern for every student according to her individual needs made our sisters open up pathways for connecting with each one, as they acquired that creative wisdom born of a true love for the reality they were encountering. Even prior to 1903, a recommendation was issued to Academy prefects. The easiest and surest means for gaining the hearts of the students is gentleness and sweetness, which we must strive to employ in such a way that it does not degenerate into weakness. Without a doubt, this concern for forming the heart, for connecting with the person, has been customary and has created a unique style in the Institute's pedagogy since the first days. Those first sisters considered it fundamental to our education. No matter how important studies are in our academies, according to the objective we have set for ourselves, the formation of the girls' hearts will always be the target we aim for in the educational field. They realize that for the human person, it is the heart where everything is at stake. As the years have gone by, educational psychology has emphasized this. The practice of personalized guidance has marked a unique, familiar style in many of our schools. It places emphasis on dialogue and listening, which, because they are considered important elements of formation, are not limited to occasional or isolated moments. It is important to nurture each girl individually and attentively. This should be done at every age level, the little ones, because they are virgin territory, where the first seed sown will be the one that is most deeply rooted, the girls in the middle grades, because they are in the critical age which their character is established and their passions are awakened, the older girls, because their eyes are opening to life. Being aware of this principle requires us to act in a corresponding way. Analyzing the means we use to accomplish the unique ends of our education, means which come from our pedagogy and are always capable of improvement. Undoubtedly, the experience which you all have, as well as the knowledge of the hearts of the girls with whom you have such close contact, will help you to perfect the methods already in place, but which can always be improved. It is remarkable that many years later, the church itself, speaking about Catholic education, refers to it as a thing of the heart. Education is a thing of the heart, and that, consequently, an authentic formative process can only be initiated through a personal relationship. From the beginning, the handmaids of the Sacred Heart have been called to contemplate the heart of Christ, incarnated in the heart of every person, in order to repair, heal, and bring life the life we have discovered in Him. Our charism is alive and creative, 
it cannot be boxed in by rules, but flourishes in the contemplation of the human heart. For this reason, teacher training and efficient methods must always aim at focusing on and reinforcing love for the student. This is the pedagogy of the heart that effectively calls us to attend to the poorest and weakest in our centers in order to be the living memory of the Lord Jesus. 2. Attention to the most needy. From the beginning, the preferential option of the Institute has been for the weakest. We are called to this preference through our charism of reparation, which distills the essence of the Gospel and the Eucharist. From this lens, it makes perfect sense to us, as it did for our foundresses and the first handmaids, to educate with and from the heart. In the past and the present, we have found many situations of poverty, which directly affect the students of our centers. The Institute, throughout its history, has always strived to be attentive to these realities. In concrete moments, we responded to certain specific poverties of society, today we respond to other poverties. In keeping with our vocation of reparation, we ought to opt, in every situation and place, for the weakest and smallest. We are not going to limit ourselves here only to the economically poor, who indeed suffer the greatest deprivations, and continue to be excluded from education and culture in many places. Situations of poverty, or also those which are seen in our centers, such as human limitations and deficiencies, which reduce and stunt students' personal development and maturation process. These privations, like links in a chain, gradually imprison young people and drag them into situations that are even more difficult. According to our charism, no one should be excluded from our educational plans. One thing that concerns me in this list of ideas is the great number of students whom we declare to be unfit for further study. The fact that the students of an academy obtain good scores in the state examination is not an indicator of the level of the academy. If the only girls who make it to the test are the particularly gifted students, or the good students who are extraordinarily hard workers, I would like for us to never dismiss a student just because of academics. Concentrating our efforts on the assistance necessary for the students with less ability, with the goal of maximizing their success, has always been an orientation of the Institute. It would be wise to ask ourselves, in all sincerity, what makes our centers worthwhile. Our great successes, or rather the efforts we exert to try to include the students who struggle with major deficiencies or live in unusually difficult situations. It is true that today, educators have to manage and keep this tension in balance, but this does not contradict the need for high-quality teaching, quality that calls us in turn to revise our commitments and take on new ones, basing our actions on our charism. In the area of admissions, according to our constitutions, and indeed the majority of the congregation's writings from the earliest times on, preference must be given to those most in need, in every sense of the word. For the admission of students, a certain basic intelligence quotient must be in place, but not previous preparation. A minimum intelligence quotient is an indicator that the girl is normal, at least in her intelligence, which does not mean, in any way, that we must select the brightest girls. These positions bring us inevitably to another aspect of our pedagogy, to that personalized, individual attention owed to each student. To individualize education in the manner and format which the needs of each girl demand, educate each girl, since each one is one of a kind, souls are not duplicated. Although it has not always been carried out successfully, the Institute has always recommended this pedagogical practice in our educational ministry. Centering our teaching on the individual person before us, with his or her environment, abilities, and personality characteristics, has been a constant challenge, but one that can lead to more effective teaching. Education must direct all its activity to gaining a profound knowledge of the girl, and to adapt the actions of the academy so that, from the first moment, it may be truly educational. The constitutions of 1894 already allude to this differentiation in schools. We will try to separate the girls, distributing them into two or more sections, paying attention not only to their ages, but also to their development and needs. In one of our first regulations, in the part which addresses the duties of teachers, it says that the knowledge of the individual girls in order to adapt her action to the capacity of the student, to her learning styles, temperament etc. Besides, this adapting is in a certain sense a duty in justice, 
for we should respect and develop in the girl all the natural qualities that God has given her and to educate her without stunting any of her natural talents. A few years later, the same topic is reiterated. They the teachers have to be considered collaborators in the work of education and formation of the girls, not merely as teachers, for which reason they should be very well versed in pedagogy and study the characters of the girls attentively in order to bring them to God. This attention and the study of the student leads to diversifying methods in education, which avoids forcing everyone into the same intellectual mold without keeping in mind individual talents and the different rhythms of maturation. From the disregard of this principle come almost all the difficulties, discouragements, and thus the development of laziness, for there is nothing that so demoralizes and disables a girl for work as demanding efforts greater than her ability. This is a point of which the teacher should be very mindful, gauging what she must require and how she is to require it from each student is a task that demands much concentration and even abnegation and study. Those who had the final responsibility for education in the general government of the congregation during the 1950s give very precise instructions on this point. Provide the girls with the assistance they need so that even those with less ability for studies may achieve the highest level of which they are capable. The methods that you should employ in order to achieve this are, along with understanding and interest for each one of the pupils, diligent preparation, long-term and immediate, of your classes, and the utilization of modern teaching aids. They repeat, again and again, that the curriculum should be centered on the needs of each student, always keeping in mind those who might have more difficulty in learning. Some seem to consider the ideal to be that everyone in the class be at the same level. It is evident that in the class there have to be girls of different intellectual capacities, and the merit of the teacher lies in this, that many of the less capable assimilate the fundamentals of the program, the ones of average opacity will grasp almost everything, and those who are above average will be challenged, so that each will develop according to her capacity. I know that this is difficult, and I am not telling you this expecting you to achieve it all at once, but so that you continue to orient yourselves in this sense. Today, our educational projects and programs reflect this pedagogical heritage. Our pedagogy is essentially that of effect. It stems from the love which creates life, and it respects the rhythm of growth and the differences between persons. The personalization of teaching and education presupposes a good preparation beforehand for teachers and guides. In order to carry out this mission, individualized attention is necessary. The preferential option for the weakest is what has characterized the Institute from the beginning. Although it is true that its contexts have varied, this identifying trait of the pedagogy of the heart, because of its link to our charism, cannot be reduced to an occasional practice. At the beginning of the 21st century, there are new contexts in which to develop, customize, and hone this pedagogy. The pedagogy of the heart must continue to be an identifying element of our centers. New educational spaces are expected to offer our students the necessary elements that will allow them, from the perspective of respect and intercultural dialogue, to not only welcome difference, but integrate it. This creates a new challenge for us as handmaids of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Therefore, the greatest efforts in our schools must continue to be focused on those who most need our attention. Only thus will our charism be sufficiently evident in our educational undertakings. 3. Firmness and Gentleness Today, no one is ignorant of the fact that our world has undergone a profound change in its system of values. However, no educator would deny the importance of a good system of school discipline or, as it is sometimes referred to, community living skills for the personal development of the student to educate him her in self-control and respect toward others. External discipline is necessary wherever many students are living together, but this does not mean that care should be taken only about insisting on external order. In 1896, Mother Pillar showed her concern for this era in a letter to the superior of the Academy of Caddies. Santa, may these girls not fall into the neglect of exterior discipline. A certain father has mentioned to me that in their manners they have lost a lot of ground. I don't mean slavish adherence to rules, but courtesy. The writings we have on this topic are full of discretion and understanding. The expression, knowing how to combine gentleness and firmness, repeated so many times in our literature, 
is another example of that pedagogy of the heart characteristic of the Institute. We can approach the human person in many ways, but our method has always been to address our students with gentleness and firmness. This difficult combination allowed for the creation of resilient, strong-hearted individuals, as Rafaela Maria would say. The following paragraph by Mother Olivia Rina demonstrates very well the prudence and tact which every educator should have in her actions. The double work of uprooting and implanting, which all education must carry out, not in a violent, extraneous way, but rather by means of cooperation or collaboration with nature, with the respect of one who restores God's imprint in souls, and the care of one who seeks to place within these souls the divine perfections, is no less lofty an art indeed, it is rightly called the art of all arts, because it is not a work executed in marble or bronze, but in free will. And if the sculptor, before bringing to life in marble the sketch, he has already conceived in his imagination, thinks, reflects, and takes measurements, so that when he applies the rasp or chisel, it will not spoil the marble, how carefully the educator, too, must proceed, measuring her actions in order to sculpt well and beautifully the image of God in the coarse blocks, this image within the girls, who are privileged persons, docile and moldable, to be sure, but also with a glass-like fragility that means that the slightest blow can ruin their education. Disciplinary aspects never appear as absolute values, but rather are focused as a means to achieve a formation aimed at responsible freedom. In the school rules, which Mother Sacred Heart sent to Rome in 1886, the correction of students is discussed in language that springs from the heart. She will try to win the respect and esteem of the girls, giving them with great humility and charity the advice that may be necessary, encouraging them to do good, reprimanding them with meekness. She will endeavor to converse with them individually, during which time she can inspire trust and win their hearts. In all the texts which refer to normative and disciplinary aspects of the schools, we find that the same approach predominates, understanding, kindness, listening, and trust. If this is lacking, education, the act of discovering and bringing out the best in every student, becomes difficult. In the correction of the students, and the imposition of punishment for infractions committed, she will proceed calmly and without haste. She will first look to see if there is, in fact, an infraction, and the culpability which the girl has in it. In the imposition of the punishment, kindness is preferable to excessive severity, which the students will generally regard as unjust. Furthermore, in order not to err in such a delicate and important point, it is necessary to attend not only to the gravity of the infraction, but also to each girl's age, character, constitution, education and other circumstances. Some years later, the regulations of the Academy of Madrid offers some wonderful clarifications about this ability to combine gentleness and firmness in correction. It considers it an art and science more divine than human, and insists upon the need to highlight the positive qualities of a girl before reprimanding her. The person who disciplines must seek the good, and for that reason must know the student well. It is always a good idea to separate the offense from the one who committed it, and warnings must be thought out ahead of time, fair and useful. In regard to the form of correction, it must be dignified, concise, concrete, combined with gentleness and ergy, quite firm. Mother Christina Estrada, speaking about the elements of human formation in our centers, indicated discipline as one of them, when discipline comes from an interior impulse. To achieve this end, it is necessary to know perfectly the reason behind every disciplinary practice and its value. External discipline is, as I say, a means of formation, and is always necessary when one lives in community, but it can be presented in various forms. Discipline that was good in one era might end up being harmful in another. It could in the same way be harmful for their formation to demand practices that are not justified, whether that be because today they are no longer useful or fitting, or because of the trifling way in which they are meant to be practiced. The rules of community living in our schools in order to be educational, must stimulate the use of responsible freedom, and in some cases, should awaken the critical faculties of students, so that they become able to discern true and false, good and bad. It is of fundamental importance that rules be based on serious reasons, so that they assist the growth of students in the responsibility they bear in their social environment. In 1951, there were difficulties emerging in the student community in our centers. It is more difficult for students to be submissive to academy discipline 
perhaps the reason can be found in another quality which characterizes today's youth, the critical attitude. This is not bad in itself. It is more difficult, yes, to form the person who has this quality, but once it is achieved, the formation is more solid. Within our educational style of the pedagogy of the heart, we situate the complex world of evaluation and grades. If marks constitute an important moment for students, they are important as well for educators as a means for encouraging, stimulating, and supporting the development of students' self-esteem, as our constitutions of 1894 suggest. The pedagogical orientations about this matter speak profoundly to us about the fairness we must exhibit. The teachers should be convinced that it is a sacred duty to act very much in conscience in regard to the marks, and that it would not be just to avoid giving a student that mark that she deserves. However, there is also an insistence perhaps even stronger on a well-grounded benevolence which belongs to our pedagogical style and is what truly restores a person. How often a grade inconsiderately given disconcerts a girl, defeating her good resolutions. So that the marks may serve as a stimulus, you have to keep in mind the way that the girls are, the state in which they arrive, etc. If you require them to do things that are impossible, they will become discouraged and will end up, by making no effort, seeking in other outlets the satisfaction that they do not find in their marks. In these marks, while being just, we have to be kind. I am not saying that you should easily give very high marks, but that the low ones should be the exception. Today, this subtle but necessary area of discipline and grades continues to be just as valid, but as in the past, it is truly constructive only if it is considered in reference to the person and his or her human development at the personal level, both as an individual and as a social being, remembering that each student is a unique creation and that education leads the student to humanization and personalization in the freedom to love and serve from the perspective of a critical thinker in an attitude of attention and discernment and helps improve self-esteem and growth in all his or her dimensions. The pedagogy of the heart ought to be for us the path along which we accompany our students in their growth and maturation in every aspect of their personalities. Because this approach springs from love, it must respect the identity of each one so that each person may become an agent of his or her own formation, able to collaborate in the construction of a society in which priority is placed more on being than on doing, on respect for others, solidarity, and the ongoing search for what is most just and loving.